of time. So let's quickly get to this paper and as really can't, we can't quickly discuss this paper, but I wanted to show you it because I thought it was, it's in a very important paper. It's one of the sort of cornerstone papers of uh, some modern electroanalytical chemistry. And uh, there's really not a lot to discuss about it, I don't think, but I wanted to ha you just to have it. And so let's, let's just discuss a little bit of it and maybe have some questions about what they're doing here. It's a little bit hard to follow until you get the hang of what they're doing. Remember, they're trying to develop a theory of uh, something we'll talk about next week, which we call cyclic voltammetry or linear sweep voltammetry. Uh, uh, cyclic voltammetry uses a potential sweep and rather than a step like we've talked about, so we can think about a step in potential with time. And they call that um, stationary electrode polarography. And that's kind of old fashioned terminology. First of all, they use the word polarography, which is appropriate for mercury electrodes, and that's what a lot of people were using, so that's okay. Stationary electrode means that we're not stirring the solution. We're, we're letting it, it's a diffusion controlled method, not, uh, not a, um, a rotating electrode or something like that. The um, voltammetry with linear, linearly varying potential and, and so on. So it took a while before people really came up with a widely accepted name. And so cyclic voltammetry, cyclic because it goes out and back in a cycle, or half of that, which they call linear sweep voltammetry, we'll talk about next time. So just one sweep out. Both of those are, are discussed in this paper. In particular, cyclic voltammetry, which was a difficult problem to treat. Um, in fact, he discusses this quite a bit and he says the first, the single scan is not so bad. And he talks about how reversible methods are solved, they solve that and for steady state conditions and so on and so on and so on. Uh, Mostly they ended up talking about let's get to a point that where we've got an equation to solve and then they're going to use numerical methods to solve that equation. And they develop a table of numbers for that particular result. Notice in particular on page 707, the second page, the boundary value problem, and we'll talk about this next time. We won't really do very much theoretical treatment of this, but because it gets pretty tricky right away. Uh, but the, for example, theta, equation eight, is, a, uh, is your potential term. And you see it's an exponential function with potential in it. And, uh, and then there's an a term, which is a sweep thing. So a times theta is our, is our potential shift. So those are a potential changes with, in the course of the experiment and that given, gives, gives us that result. Now for reversible systems you see that equation 11 is appropriate and that's just like the equation that we had before except that we don't have a time dependence in there. But the A term really and the, the sweep rate V just gives us a, uh, a way to give us what potential we are at any particular time. So sweep rate volts per second is the relationship between potential and time that we're looking for in this experiment. Rather than sitting at a particular potential, we're gonna be looking at a potential that changes continuously with time. But notice they're using the, um, the step function, chap, uh, section nine or equation nine. Those are our, is our step function, you know, just like we just used today in doing the solution. And um, you can see the convolution theorem is, and so they don't ultimately finish up because that, if you'll note, they say that equation, um, the direct use of the Laplace transform to solve this boundary value problem is precluded by the form of equation seven. So they can't really solve that form when they have that uh, situation in there. So they have to use, uh, they have to use uh, numerical methods. The first part, 
before they do the switch is sol solvable, and that's what they do the first step. And they make that table, table one, to uh, give, a, give them the numbers. And uh, it takes a little skill to read out what's going on. But this square root pi times chi at as a function of at is your what they call current function. And um, if you notice that current function reaches a maximum at a potential of uh, 20, minus 28 millivolts and uh, 0.4463. And, um, and then they go on in the next page, I guess page, um, a few pages down the way, it's uh, table two gives you the situation where after they solve for numerical, um, numerically the, where the peak is on the reverse sweep. So after we scan out and scan back, just like the double potential step or the potential step where we reversed it, we stepped out and stepped back, we're doing the sweep out and sweep back. Similar type of considerations. We get similar sort of information. A little bit more information than we got with a single step because you can see that curve in say in figure two, uh, the shape of the curve actually tells you a lot about it because it's, uh, because your eye can pick things out. In fact, uh, an experienced person can look at the shapes of the waves and tell things that are going on that you can't obviously see from a single uh, t to the minus one half decay uh, curve. And so that, that's why this cyclic voltammetry method is very useful uh, in that regard as it gives you a qualitative feel for what's going on uh, with the experience that you don't really get from looking at a chronal amperometric trace. Um, and if you go through there, you'll see uh, in table four, uh, I apologize for a little bit for the, for the um, quality of the photocopy. This is something I had and then I copied again and copied again. So sometimes you lose a little bit of the text here in the, in the page numbers, but you can easily figure out what's going on. Uh, table four, you can see the boundary conditions for chemical reactions. And we'll talk all about these kinds of effects of these chemical reactions a little bit later. But here's an introduction. You can see for all kinds of situations, especially now when we get into sweep voltammetry, we're going to start talking about what happens when the reaction isn't so uncomplicated. What happens if we have a chemical reaction prior to the reaction or a chemical reaction after the reaction? Well, how does that shift and how can we tell from the shape of the curves what the effect of that chemical reaction is or maybe the rate constant for that chemical reaction is and all these sorts of things. And, uh, and we'll see how that's useful in, uh, in cyclic voltammetry. A lot of the coupled chemical reactions I'm not so worried about. I mean, you, they're, most of the time now people don't solve these equations numerically or set them up this way to do the solutions to these uh, equations. It turns out that there's a method called digital simulation that directly simulates the response that actually turns out to be simpler in many ways than, than these. But <coughs> these are still useful. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm doing a lot of talking here, but I wanted you to look through these, especially in the next chapter, because all of the stuff they're talking about is stuff that we're going to be interested in in uh, understanding about um, cyclic voltammetry and the effect of chemical reactions on cyclic voltammetry. So next time we'll talk mostly about just the theory for CVs. But then later on, we'll talk about chemical reactions with CVs, and then this paper again will be useful. But uh, this guy Nicholson, R.S. Nicholson, I think, went on to become the editor of uh, science, or is that right? So he's a grad student, and uh, later went on to be a uh, fairly high up guy in the, in the science and so on, so. Is there any, any questions in particular you had about this? I know it's, it's a very complicated paper, but um, is there anything that was puzzling to you guys? Just to do it for the page 722. Mm -hmm. 
But we use these graphs here as some kind of spectroscopy. This what? for the different processes. Like figure 17, 18, and 19. Mm -hmm. Well, each of those Roman numerals is a different case that they've discussed on that table. So yeah. if you're looking, see case 3, and that's the bottom, and that, and that V is a scan rate, and that'll be volts per second. So you're talking about from 0.01 volts per second to 10 volts per second. Yeah. What I'm saying, how, how the, these are kept like if you are doing an experiment, and you, get, you have to plot your data in a way similar to this, and compare between your, or just they, they made it to show up what they did. I think in both cases, I think both are true. One, one way, I mean, they're, what they're doing is taking and extracting some parameter and then plotting it versus some easily adjustable experimental parameter, which is often what you do. You say, what, what if I had a, what if I looked at the peak potential and I changed the scan rate? What would happen? Okay. Well, that's something you could measure. You could measure the peak potential and you look at the scan rate. And you could plot that just like they've plotted here and you could compare. And you can say, well, does it fit one of these lines? Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. So that's one thing you could do. The other thing you could do is just use these as an indication uh, in general what's going on. You know, when I have case number eight, I see that the current goes way up when I, when I um, the current function increases as I decrease the scan rate, whereas in case three, the, the current function decreases as I increase the scan rate. So you can see the, qualitatively at least, the differences in the, in the kinds of, what the chemical kinetics are doing to the result that you can observe. Also notice, you know, so they're taking the current function, which is just the peak current, the peak potential in figure 18, and the peak the ratio of the forward and reverse currents in figure 19. So three very easily measured quantities and they're plotting them for all these cases for you to look at. So you could do that yourself. You could take all those experimental parameters, plot them, and you can say, well, maybe it fits very nicely on this one. And then I see, if I compare the ratios of the currents, it fits very nicely here. And if I look at the peak potentials, I look and it fits very nicely here. So it must be that case, you know, or something like that. Maybe you won't be able to get exactly the kinetics in that case, but you can isolate what's going on. So, but they depend a lot on these current functions, which are just dimensionless numbers that they divide through to give to me very general results. But lots of information in this paper, and so I suggest that you uh, uh, as we're reading, as we get more and more into the theory, you can read more and more into it and see where we're at at each point and get some good information about it. Uh, um, a lot of the theoretical treatment I wouldn't worry so much about, but being able, the results are what's interesting and you should be interested in that. Well, we're probably out of time, so um, we'll stop here.